Hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you that you would come into this place that is called by your name. We have availed ourselves. We have come for this appointment. We pray that you would deal with us, that you would do with us, that you would speak to us as you wish. May you be glorified and honored in this place. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. Allow me to say this morning, I'm born again. The Lord Jesus is my personal savior. I am in this walk of salvation. This is the gift of God. Amen. And even before we get into the hearing of God's word, I want to honor the father of this house, uh, Bishop Jimmy Kimani and Pastor Alice, who are not in today. They never absconded the their duties, they are actually out on a mission, or made a mission. When was the last time you went for a mission? Mission ya kuhubiri, wacha hiyo ingine, is a preaching mission. And they know that uh, we are here and doing this. They have allowed us to do this. We are forever grateful. Amen, amen. I want to talk about salvation. And the topic of my sharing this uh, morning is is salvation now and not yet. And as, as I talk about this, just before you start saying what is this that you're talking about, um, this idea of salvation now and not yet is a principle that I see carried through in, 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 in the Bible when we talk about God's kingdom. In the kingdom of God, we have salvation. In the kingdom of God, we have many other things that God has done for us. And so for those of us that are catching us from wherever it is, we welcome you to be together with us in this service. And as we talk about salvation now and not yet, I want us to go into understanding that salvation is a process. One of our pastors likes uh, saying that binguni nimbali sana, meaning for those that do not understand, that heaven is 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 far is far <laughs> yeah it is a journey it's a process and i'm told everything that goes through a process at the end of the day it comes out better than it started a process will take us through places a process will take us through times that are hard a process will take us through good times even but at the end of the process, the one who is taking us through this process is having an idea at the end of the day of what they want us to become. And the owner of this process is God himself. And so I dare say here that salvation is a process. I want, before we get into hearing this, just divine, define what salvation is. The definition that I have for salvation if somebody asked you, what is salvation? I know most of us who say salvation is being born again. But then I ask, what is being born again? Ni kuokoka. So what is kuokoka? Because um, we, know, we know what it is, but we don't know how to say it. I know many times I get myself there. I know what it is, but I don't know how to say it. Now, my definition, um, and, and part of the definitions that we'll be working uh, with, is salvation is deliverance from the power and effects of sin. Deliverance from the power and effects of sin, danger, or difficulty by God's intervention. Now, this is the definition according to the New Living Translation life application study bible that is what it says the webster dictionary says that salvation is the redemption of man from the bondage of sin and the liability of eternal death webster says redemption of man from the bondage of sin and the liability of uh, to eternal death and the conferring on that person everlasting life. I 
Another definition would be salvation is the application of the work of Christ. Salvation is the application of the work of Christ to the life of an individual or the individual. And he continues to say that the goal of salvation is God's supreme, ultimate glory, which he rightly deserves. I take that again. Salvation is the application of the work of Christ to the life of the individual. The goal of salvation is God's supreme, ultimate glory, which he rightly deserves. And so we can say confidently that salvation is about God. Allow me also to say that salvation is found solely in the man and work of Jesus Christ. We have no other place that we can get salvation. It is only in the work. It is in the man and the work of Jesus Christ. And so... After saying all that, then we ask ourselves the question that the jailer who had Paul and Silas in prison, the question that he asked himself when he woke up or when he realized that he had two prisoners and the gates were wide open and the prisoners didn't run away. And then he asks, what must I do to be saved? We've talked about what salvation is. Allow me to go into what salvation is not, and then we'll get into a text and uh, make a few um, conclusions. Salvation is not casual. Salvation cannot be reduced to three ABCs on a page or what we call four spiritual laws. And I have nothing against the four spiritual laws. It is a good item for witnessing, but salvation cannot be reduced to the four spiritual laws. Salvation is not just asking Jesus into your heart, uh, as we see in Revelation 3 and verse 20. It is not just in saying the sinner's prayer. Salvation is not even walking down the aisle and shaking the pastor's hand. The other day we were told there is baptism that happens when you come to the pastor and they spit on you. Now, if you for a moment thought that salvation is shaking the, the leader of the denomination, shaking their hand, that is not it. Salvation is not even going to church and doing other religious activities. It is not even getting dipped in water and, you know, speaking in new tongues. Again, I reiterate and say salvation is about God. It's not about you. Amen? In the book of uh, Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 8 and 9, Scripture tells us that it is by grace that we are saved. Are you able to give us NLT? For by grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves. This is what NLT says. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Verse number nine. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. And that is, that is the principle that we see in the Bible. Salvation is not because of the good things that we have done. And I know most of us have done good things. Salvation is not even because you have achieved a lot. None of us in the best of ourselves could have attained salvation. I like somebody who says that if a child was born today and they were kept in an environment that would cause them to grow and mature and develop in every way without the influence of the outside world, they were locked in a place not having the interference of the outside world that they would still need salvation. Amen? 
And so salvation is a work of God. It is the gift of God. It is by grace that we have been saved through faith. None of us can say that we were good enough. None of us can say that we never went through this kind of a life. None of us can say that I was not involved in this and the other. Now some of us were involved in everything. <laughs> but thank God it is a gift. Because if it were because we merited or because we worked hard, some of us would not even have had this salvation. But blessed be God, it is a gift of God by grace through faith. We are not saved because we pray much and we fast and we do all those many things that are religious and they are good. We are not saved because we read the Bible. We are not saved because we are saved by grace through faith. Now having said that, let us examine the process of salvation. We said this is a process. Now a process has a beginning and it has an end. We just said in our definition that God who is the main character here, who is the author of salvation, has an end in mind of what he wants you and I to become at the end of the process. And believe you me, I want to submit to us that salvation is a process. It is a process in this way, and we'll be looking at those three um, divisions of salvation. There is a beginning or a starting point. There is the continuum and there is the end. The, the speaker who spoke in the first service, I think he was just speaking about the same, same subject, but in a different way. The fear of the Lord. Scripture would tell us that from the beginning, God has had a plan since the creation of man. And God momentarily gave us what we are waiting for at the end of the day, at the end of the process. Adam and Eve are placed by God in the Garden of Eden where everything was perfect. You have gardens all over, but none of those gardens gets close to the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, man lived with animals, I guess. Man lived without having to struggle. Man had everything that he needed, and including God coming to visit with them. But sin came into the world. In Genesis chapter 3, and man was banished from the perfect setting that God had. And so we got into a process and this is the process that you and I find ourselves in. As we go to the place that God has promised, because there is a place that we are going to, heaven is a good place. If you don't believe it, I want you to hear this, that there is a heaven that we are going to and it is a good place. And in heaven there will be no crying. In heaven there will be no sorrow. In heaven, there will be no COVID. In heaven, there will be no sickness. In heaven, that is a place where God dwells. And God wants us to get there. The means and the how to get there, God has provided in the way of salvation. And that's why we are saying salvation is a process. I was to read the book of John chapter number 3 as our main text and see this man that is called Nicodemus coming to Jesus and he says... He's coming at night. The long and short of this account is that Nicodemus gets born again and the rest is history like they say. In the book of John, chapter number 3, this is what it says. We're going to read um, quite a lengthy uh, portion. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with them. Says in verse number three, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, unto thee, unto NLT, is it possible? So that we are not thee and thine. 
please or niv give us niv this is no more jesus replied very truly i tell you no one can see the kingdom of god unless they are born again verse number 4 how can some someone be born when they are old that was a very valid question imagine you're living in times of nicodemus and nicodemus scripture says that he was a pharisee he was a teacher of the law he was not just a nobody he was a learned person he was of 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 the class of the people that were learned he he was in the sanhedrin the people who used to govern the council that used to govern he was well versed in the law of the jews and he knew what he was teaching and jesus comes along and says to nicodemus that you need to be born again and nicodemus does not understand that and he's asking in this uh discussion that they're having with jesus how can someone be born when they are old nicodemus asked surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born verse 5 jesus answered very truly i tell you no one can enter the kingdom of god unless they are born of water and the spirit flesh gives birth to flesh but the spirit gives birth to spirit you should not be surprised at my saying jesus says you must be born again the wind blows wherever it pleases you hear its sound but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going so it is with everyone born of the spirit how can this be nicodemus asked you are israel's teacher said jesus and you do not understand these things very truly i tell you we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen but still you people do not accept our testimony i have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe how then will you believe if i speak of heavenly things no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven the son of man just as moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have may have eternal life in him then we come to a most favorite verse for all time for god so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life for god did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him whoever believes in him is not condemned but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of god's one and only son verse 19 says this is the verdict light has come into the world but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for the fear that their deeds will be exposed but whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that they have done uh, what they have done has been done in the sight of god amen a teacher of the law if you'd want a lawyer of those days he was the one who was teaching the jews on the law of moses and what was required of it and because he has witnessed what jesus has been doing he has witnessed the miracles that jesus has been performing he has interrogated the work that jesus is doing he gets to a point and he realizes that this cannot be an ordinary man that jesus must have been sent from god and so he listens and jesus introduces nicodemus to salvation scripture would say that this is a mystery that we cannot understand until it is revealed to us now when we tell people that we are born again people look at us and they think something is wrong with you and being born again 
is such a drastic change in one's life that we have no other words to explain but to say we are born again. This Nicodemus that we are talking about here, who comes to Jesus by night, he was doing that because he, like you and me, had a reputation. He thought, what would people say? I have been the teacher here, and yet I do not understand these things. Now, if the teacher doesn't understand, I pity that class. Have you gone to a class where the teacher does not understand what they are teaching? So where are the students? And the parents have paid school fees. Now this was Nicodemus. He didn't understand. And Jesus tells him, you must be born again. And like many people would think, he had not come to spy on Jesus so that he... He, hand, he hands him uh, to the persecutioners or to those that wanted to arrest Jesus. He was coming because there was a conviction deep down his heart. He had listened, he had seen, he had experienced, and that resonated with his heart that this man must be coming from God. And what he's saying is true. And Jesus introduces Nicodemus to the kingdom. This same Nicodemus, we would later find him in John 19 and verse number 39, as the man who comes together with Joseph of Arimathea. It says, and there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloe, about a hundred pound weight. Now, this is the man who was asking about how can someone be born again? And after they have crucified Jesus, and after Jesus is dead because he died, amen? Amen? Praise God, Jesus died. Please, I know we feel bad when we say that, but in his dying, that is where our freedom is. Praise the Lord, Jesus died. And this time when Jesus is dead, the other person who comes, or who is taking Jesus to the tomb where he was to be laid, that person, together with Joseph of Arimathea, who gave his place for Jesus to be buried, is Nicodemus, who came by night to ask, what must I do to be born again? Today we might not understand, but the truth is, looking at what is happening around us, looking at the things that our people are going through, and for a moment, you feel the heaviness, you feel the mourning that is amongst our people, you feel the pain that is all around. Families have been left without breadwinners. Children have been left without their mothers. And for a moment you're thinking, we are so helpless and hopeless. I come to tell us, in spite of all this, the salvation that belongs to our God is here with us. And those things that we are going through are part of the process of salvation. When we came into the kingdom, we were never promised an easy time. I guess none of us was told, now your troubles, your pains, your sorrows are over. We were, however, promised eternal life, which is found in Christ Jesus. And so, as we go through the process, as we are sanitized in this process, those are the words that we are getting used to, as the Lord purges us from day to day, it is in the process of salvation. And the process of salvation then allow me to say, has three major steps, and then we will be bringing this to a close. Number one, remember we say there is a beginning and there is an end. The beginning point of our salvation, the gift of God, yes, given to us, but we need to receive it, is at conversion. 
I know we have so many people who argue about how is it possible for you to be born again while you're in this life. They have some truth in that statement, but that's not all. Salvation has a beginning point where we call conversion. The place of repentance. Now, in that place of repentance, that is the place where God calls his people. In this powerful way, God calls us out of darkness into his marvelous light. First Peter chapter 2 and verse number 9 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. First Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse number 9 says, God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son Jesus Christ. And into his own kingdom, God has called you for his own glory. Now, at conversion, there is a willingness from you and I to respond to the gospel, to respond to the call of God. We sincerely repent our sins at conversion. Repentance is sincerely repenting, turning away from our sins and placing our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. Conversion, uh, con conversion, therefore, involves both you and God being at work. It is a work of repentance and faith. Repentance is you are headed this direction, you turn 180 degrees. In other words, you can say, I am headed this way, and then I repent. In other words, I turn around, and I'm heading this way. Now, that is repentance. And this is God wooing us by his spirit into his kingdom. And as we get into God's kingdom, then we get into the process. And like we have said, that is the beginning of the process of salvation. And when we get there, then it is important for us to know that Jesus will not become our savior without becoming our Lord. He saves us. It is his work. We do not qualify. We do not merit. It is all his work. And he brings us into salvation. But when he becomes our savior, he also has to become our Lord. He has to become the one who says what needs to happen in that life. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He is the one who says what needs to be happening in that life. In the process of salvation, number two is what we call sanctification. Now, sanctification is where we are at. We got born again at some point. We made that prayer. We started walking with the Lord. We declared that, yes, we want to belong into the kingdom of God because the gift has always been there. And we said yes. So sanctification then is the progressive work of God and man that makes us more free from sin and makes us more like Christ. So in sanctification, we become, it is a process of making us more free from sin and makes us more like Christ. Sanctification involves more than a mere moral reformation of character brought about by the power of the truth. It is the work of the Holy Spirit bringing the whole nature more and more under the influence of the new gracious principles implanted in the soul at regeneration. So, it is a work of God that continues. The truth is, it is not possible for us to continue in sanctification minus the Holy Spirit. Because he is the one who keeps reminding us you know, those lights that keep going off when something happens and tells you, this is not your place. You are not supposed to be doing this. And I'm saying this to people who are here who are not perfect because none of us is perfect. Even the best of us, none of us is perfect. Just say that if a child was born and put in a place secluded from everybody else, they would still need salvation. And I'm also here to tell you, please do not beat yourself so much because you failed here and you failed there. Because you're not the owner of salvation. It is God who saves. 
And we are in this process. We are going through tough times. We are going through hard times. This is sanctification for you and for me, my brother, my sister. We do not know what awaits us. But we can say, yes, whatever it is that is going to happen, I know I'm in the process of salvation. I know there are people who believe and uh, preach that salvation can only be continuous. They have a bit of truth, but that's not it. And finally, number three, we have the ultimate goal of salvation, which is the final stage that we call perfection or glorification. Now, glorification is the final step in salvation. It will happen. We can say it is happening. The truth is God is lifting us from one glory to the other. So we are being glorified. But there is a day that this shall be complete. It will come. That day is coming. When the Lord comes and you and I are changed and given new bodies. Bodies that will not fast. Bodies that will not hunger. Bodies that will not have pain. Bodies that will not die. Those are the things that we are waiting for when salvation finally comes to the final stage. And so you and I as believers, we will be given that perfect resurrection body that we keep on saying that when we see Jesus, we will know him, we will be looking like him. That is what awaits us. As we go through this process, I remember yesterday when we were in a G12 meeting and Pastor Alice was sharing with us and saying, during these times, one of the things that is at risk is the peace that God has given to us. We have so many people who are peaceless because of what is happening. Another thing I dare to say that is at risk is your salvation. You are not promised that it's going to be easy. You are not promised that things are not going to be hard. And so salvation is also at risk. I pray that in the name of Jesus that you would hear that this is a process that we are in. When we get to the final stage, where there will be no crying, no, there will be no sorrow, there will be no pain, there will be no hunger, we will not thirst, we will not... These things that are subject to the elements, that shall be the final stage. But as we continue in the process, brother, sister, God, that salvation. God, that peace. The kingdom of uh, God, we have just said, that there is a principle in the Bible that talks about the kingdom of God now, but not yet. Because there is a time that we are waiting for the revelation of the Son of Man. And that shall be the kingdom that we are waiting for. When it shall be fully done. But before we get there, we are in a process. Wake up to the fact that the fact that you got sick doesn't mean that you have lost God. The fact that you fell in this and the other situation doesn't mean that God is not there. You need to wake up, rise up, dust yourself because this is the process of sanctification. You do not sanctify something that has impurities. You don't need to. You do not sanitize if you don't have the virus or the likelihood of having a virus or the germs. And that's why we will keep on sanitizing. And we'll be sanitized by God's word and the fellowship of believers as we go into this. And we can talk about this over and over again. But brothers and sisters, do not lose sight of salvation as a process. Anybody who will tell you that you cannot be saved while you're in this world, they are lying to you. We are saved. We have eternal life. Scripture say in the book of John chapter number 3 and verse number 16 we just read. We receive eternal life. But yes, we are still waiting for that day. When it shall be complete. We are waiting for the manifestation of the kingdom of God. That was at the garden of Eden. We are going through this process. We are not perfect. But there is a kingdom at the end of the day that is coming. That will be perfect. And that is for you and for me who keep the faith. Allow me to bring this into a conclusion. I want to read the scriptures in the book of Titus chapter number 3. If you would give us Titus chapter number 3. And verse uh, yes, Titus chapter number three from verse number three. We're going to read through to eight. It's quite a, a, a portion of scripture. This is what scripture says. Let's start from verse number one even. 
Titus chapter 3, verse number 1, we'll read through to... Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good. Verse number 2, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate and always to be gentle toward everyone. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Those are the things that we need to embark on. We are in a process. Let us not give up. Our salvation is at risk. Because of what we could be going through, remember we are just in a process. We might suffer loss right now, but there is a final stage of our salvation when everything shall be perfect. And so when we have no peace, when we are ailing, when we have missed the mark, do not give up. Don't give up on God. He's still at work. Don't give up because your loved one has gone. Don't give up because you have been affected by the virus. Don't give up because of this and the other. Let us continue in the walk. And I say this in the name of the Lord. Amen. Are you here? And you're saying, I knew there was a time I committed my life to the Lord. But I got lost in the process. I no longer consider myself as part of those that are in the process. Or are you here and you're saying, this process has been too hard for me. I don't know what to do. And you're almost giving up want to make a prayer for us. Or you are saying, you are taught that it is not possible to be saved in this world that has seen and is lacking, that salvation can only come at the end. I tell you, there is a beginning, there is a continuum, and there is the end. Let's bow our heads. And if you are here, you want to pray to the Lord for any of those things that I have mentioned. If you put up your hand, I will see it. We will pray together. That God will hold us, carry us through the process, take us to the very end, because he is the giver of salvation. Are you there? You want to give your life to Jesus? Or are you there and you're saying, yes, I realize that I am in the process, but I'm about to give up. If you lift up your hand, we'll see it and we're going to pray together. Or are you there and you're saying, I have not even any clue about that end that you're talking about. I am not convinced there is a kingdom like that you're talking about if you lift up your hand we'll see it and we're going to pray together amen shall we pray together father in the name of jesus we want to thank you for this moment we thank you that salvation indeed belongs to our god if salvation was because we merited or because we achieved none of us would stand I pray that in the name of Jesus, as you teach us, and as you take us through the process, as you hold us with your righteous right hand, our Father, that we will not lose focus of the place where you are taking us. I want to thank you for your people. Thank you because salvation has come to us, is a gift of God, and we have stretched out our hands to receive that gift of God. We pray that it shall have a work, and a permanent work in us, to the praise and to the glory of your dear name. We thank you and we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.